Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Puerto Rico is being strangled with debt. What's the solution? This week on the show, journalist Ed Morales and activist Charles Kahn talk about the roots of the crisis and how a colonial approach to a colonial problem just might not solve it. Later, we visit with the urban bushwomen who are making change through dance, and you'll get a few words from me on Yale's aversion to paying more taxes. Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to those who are doing. Three point five million Americans in Puerto Rico are in a dire crisis. The island territory is mired in debt and facing imminent default. Media coverage here has mostly blamed the last 20 years, when tax breaks for corporations were rolled back and loans were extended that couldn't be paid. Our next guests say that the roots of Puerto Rico's problems go way deeper than that to U.S. colonial rule. And if colonialism is at least in part the culprit here, it's pretty ironic that the solutions on offer from Congress these days seem to be so, well, colonial. To talk about that, Charles Kahn. He's the organizing director at the Strong Economy for All Coalition, a coalition of labor unions and community groups fighting for economic equality, equal funding of public schools and corporate accountability in New York State. He's also a leader of the Hedge Clippers. More about that in a moment. Ed Morales is a journalist who has investigated New York City electoral politics, police brutality, street gangs, grassroots activists, and the Latino arts and music scene. His books include Living in Spanglish and the Latin Beat, From Rumba to Rock. He's also co-directed a documentary called Who's Barrio? And he's currently an adjunct professor at Columbia University's Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race. Welcome both. Ed, let's start with you. Um, we do hear some pretty scary headlines, but we don't, I think most of us have much of a picture of what is really going on in Puerto Rico. Um, can you paint a, paint a bit of a scene for us? Sure. I mean, the number that's being bandied about is about $73 billion in debt that uh, Puerto Rico owes. Um, there is a looming uh, health care crisis. And um, about uh, 300,000 people have left Puerto Rico in the last 10 years. And there's projections that there may be 600,000 um, in this decade between 2010 and 2020. Um, right now, there's a bill in Congress that's supposed to restructure the Puerto Rican debt. Um, unfortunately, um, it involves imposing an onerous fiscal oversight board that would be named by Congress um, and have no Puerto Rican rec representation um, uh, and that's what the bill in Congress is uh, looking for right now. Do you now. have a personal connection to all this? Um, sure. Um, my parents were born there. Uh, they, uh, my family still, uh, they moved back, so I go three or four times a year. Um, I have a lot of friends down there. Um, I, I kind of feel like I'm living in both worlds, actually, um, and that's been increasing um, in the last 10 years or so. Fiscal Oversight Board, where have we heard that before? Uh, Detroit? Flint? Yeah, Washington. Yeah. Um, the only problem is that uh, the colonial implications are that uh, there, there's, a, there's only going to be one person on the board who may be Puerto Rican because there's only a requirement for one person to actually reside in Puerto Rico out of the seven-person board. Uh, so, well, okay, well, so while we're putting people into the picture here, and we'll come back to this board in a minute, you've talked a lot about numbers, billions, millions. What about people? What, what's life like for people living in Puerto Rico today? Well, um, you know, Puerto Ricans have always been, on average, much poorer than any other state in the Union. I mean, Puerto Rico is not a state, it's an unincorporated territory. But um, there were several programs that began in the 1950s to build a small uh, working and middle class in Puerto Rico that um, uh, created a sense of prosperity that was mainly designed to, com to combat, uh, uh, for public relations reason, the Communist Revolution, to show that there would be an island in the Caribbean that would be propped up by uh, democracy and capitalism. Um, but uh, the model for the Puerto Rican economy has always been one of capital extraction, where none of the profits were reinvested in the island. And so uh, in 2006, this uh, provision that gave uh, corporations these huge tax breaks to um, set up businesses in Puerto Rico was discontinued. Um, actually, it was discontinued in 1996. It was a 10-year phase-out. And by 2006, uh, Puerto Rico went into a recession. Now, through all this time, the government continued to borrow just to cover expenses. And so that's how they accumulated. Mm, and is that stuff. where the hedge funds came in, Charles? 
It is, right? Uh, I think uh, a special type of hedge fund, uh, a vulture hedge fund, right, is what they're called by their peers. Um, because they, That's what even your friends call it. Right, you, you know right. Um, because they, they go after uh, countries that have economies that are, that are weak, countries that are going to default on their debt. They buy up the debt for really cheap prices, and then they do everything in their power to make your life a living hell. Now people and watching this in profits. countries like Argentina. <laughs> yeah, people in Argentina, people in, in Greece, they completely understand what's going on. People like Paul Singer, um, Blue Mountain Capital, uh, lots of other hedge funders. You know, they say that hedge funds um, own up more than half of all of the $73 billion debt is owned by hedge funds. Um, no. and what they've done is they pushed austerity on the Puerto Rican people to try and reap profits that, you know, range anywhere from 200% profit to 800% profit. Now, I've seen a lot of coverage that kind of repeats some of the language of the 2008 capitalist crisis t here in the United States that says, you know, all these people went into loans that weren't forced on them. They didn't have to sign on the dotted line. Um, isn't this Puerto Rico's fault for signing up with the vultures? I mean, I think as, as Ed, you know, explained, you know, Puerto Rico because of American laws was, was, was set up almost for failure, right? And they were put in a very difficult position and they took loans um, because they needed to provide basic services for their people. Um, and what we need to do is help uh, address this debt crisis and also give Puerto Rico and help Puerto Rico to address, you know, kind of this neo-colonialism mm. that has, has helped cause this crisis, right? Now, now we're going to talk about the, the longer term roots, but in the relatively short period that you've just mentioned, Ed, and you've both, you've both talked about, there have been some very specific rules passed for Puerto Rico, right. um, which have a lot to do with the question of what its options might be. One of them is this um, 1984 law that made it impossible for Puerto Rico to um, claim and declare bankruptcy. Right. What else is special about the law when it comes to these questions in Puerto Rico? Well, um, one policy that uh, the bonds were sold under was a triple tax exemption, which is another thing that made Puerto Rico really attractive to uh, bond buyers. And uh, the fact is that uh, the hedge funds came in, or the vulture funds came in, when Puerto Rico's economy was already distressed. Another similarity is that um, the bond rating agencies um, did nothing to really warn uh, people who were making these investments or, you know, before the, the vulture funds came in. Now, the bankruptcy law, um, that was uh, kind of a quirk because of uh, uh, an argument over whether Puerto Rico's status as a territory should allow it to be, uh, declare bankruptcy. Unfortunately, what's happened is that because the investors knew that Puerto Rico would not be able to declare bankruptcy, that made the bonds more attractive. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, and the hedge fund investors and, and creditors have spent millions and millions of dollars on Washington lobbyists to make sure that uh, bankruptcy is not an option for Puerto Rico. Um, and that's uh, part of the reason why the Puerto Rican people are so concerned about this oversight board, right? Because the same people that, you know, were lobbied in Washington to prevent Puerto Rico from being being able to use bankruptcy um, may be the same people that end up on this on this board. And who's um, appointed the members? Congress. Yes. So that's the colonial part. Yes, very much so. You know, John Oliver got to some of this in a in a recent report on his program last week last week tonight. It was really pretty good, and and he brought Lin Manuel Miranda in um, to make a plea to Congress for help. Here's a clip. Paul Ryan, I'll come sing Hamilton at your house. I'll do -si do with Pelosi. I'll wear my Hamilton blouse. Your citizens are suffering. Stop the bleeding. Stop the loss. How Puerto Rico? It's just a hundred miles across. I thought it was pretty great, but I read your column, Ed, and not so much. <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I, I met, I'm, I'm sure it was well intentioned on, on both of their parts, but um, unfortunately, they didn't mention. Um, the problem, the main problem that at least Puerto Ricans on the island see, which is the Fiscal Oversight Board, because they see how it represents a return of colonialism. There's a lot of opposition on the island, um, really from mainstream politicians to the grassroots and leftist organizations, because uh, it represents a control of Puerto Rico's affairs from, from the outside. And um, I, I think it disturbed me a little bit that uh, Miranda was uh, offering to trade uh, tickets for the show to you know, right-wing Republicans who really don't have the interests of yeah. Puerto Rican Yeah, we should say he's the, he's the, yeah. the, the writer and the yeah. star of the yeah. hit musical Hamilton right. on Broadway. Yeah. 
So look, talk about that resistance a little bit. What are hedge clippers or is hedge clippers? Sure. Um, so hedge clippers is a group and we came together to expose um, and inform people about the ways that hedge funds use their money and their power um, to really drive politics in this country um, and to really uh, find ways to uh, build their own power, right? To keep building massive amounts of money, keep building massive amounts of, of wealth. Um, and we've also taken a, a deep look at the collateral damage that billionaire-driven politics has on, on, you know, Americans. And what are you suggesting people do? I mean, I, I think the big thing is that we have to hold hedge funds accountable for, for what they do, right? A lot of hedge funds, they, um, they benefit from loopholes that they've worked really, really hard to have, things like the carried interest loophole, and they pay less taxes than teachers and truck drivers and nurses. Um, and because they have all that money, they're able to, to buy politicians to get what they want in Puerto Rico, to get what they want in New mm. York, to get what they want often around the globe. Um, and really what we're looking for is to hold hedge funds accountable, to rein them in, um, and to make sure that we are fighting for a government and an economy that can work for everyone and not just for the people um, that know how to crank the gears. And is Hedge Clippers only active in Puerto Rico or on Puerto Rican issues? Sure. No. So I, we started off in New York and we've expanded across the country because um, we know that Puerto Rican, uh, we know that hedge funds are involved across the globe. Um, and. Puerto Ricans are, are American mm -hmm. citizens, um, and we understood there was debt crisis, and we understood that hedge funds were playing a huge role. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were writing about it, that we were taking action to help the Puerto Rican people, and to make sure that people uh, across the globe understand what's going on in Puerto Rico, who's to blame, and, and why they're doing it. And you looked in your commentary to the history of Puerto Ricans organizing for themselves for change um, and for self-determination. Where do you see possibilities there for impact today? Well, right now there is a, a commission that's uh, studying the debt, that's doing what they call a forensic audit of the debt, which means that it's not really a, an accountant's audit of the debt, like who spends what or who owes what. Um, it's trying to examine the legality of the debt, and they're using this 19th century case uh, uh, called Littlefield versus Ballou as a precedent, which was actually brought up in the Detroit uh, bankruptcy case and saved Detroit, I think, $1.2 billion, which says that if part of the debt is found to be um, illegal, um, then mm -hmm. it shouldn't be paid. However, uh, one thing that's been pointed out to me is that in the House bill, um, there is, a, there is a, a, a language in the bill that says the debts must be paid whether they're illegal or not. <laughs> that is quite so, some language. Um, but a lot of Puerto Ricans are organizing, again, um, it's interesting how it involves mainstream politicians and grassroots activists um, about paying atten uh, drawing attention to the U.S.'s responsibility in the matter, particularly, uh, you know, the first instance would be this, the illegality of this debt. Yeah. And I think it's going to be a big rallying cry. I don't think that, I think that even if the bill passes, there's going to be um, a lot of uh, civil mm -hmm. disobedience and protests. Now, there are models. I mean, I was in Ecuador yeah. and I interviewed their yeah. finance minister, Pedro Paez, mm -hmm. and in that country, yeah. that's exactly what they did. They yeah. went in and they discovered that at least a third of the debt was right. illegal and they just wrote it off. Yeah, but unfortunately, they have uh, recourse to international courts and uh, they also have access to international uh, loan uh, systems, but Puerto Rico um, doesn't. I mean, it can, it can go to international, but it's relatively isolated because uh, doesn't have sovereign status. Now, are any of the people on the presidential campaign trail saying the right thing about Puerto Rico? Well, Bernie Sanders uh, has been most progressive, um, has called for uh, intervention, intervention by the, the Federal Reserve or executive powers. Hillary Clinton has been um, less committal and, in fact, two um, significant uh, Puerto Rican leaders, uh, the mayor of San Juan and an LGBT leader, who uh, Pedro Julio Serrano. The mayor of San Juan is uh, and, and Pedro Julio Serrano are, are both uh, uh, announced that they were withdrawing their support for Hillary Clinton because she did not explicitly denounce the uh, fiscal oversight mm. board. For sure. And, and Donald Trump, in true Donald Trump fashion, has been all over the place, right? He came out and he said, you know, he loves debt and he likes bankruptcy for himself, but he doesn't think it's good for Puerto Rico. And then after a pushback from lots of Puerto Rican groups, you know, hedge clippers included, he said that, you know, he thinks that Puerto Rico should be able to restructure his debt. Um, but they've all been talking about it, which is good, you know, because I think, you know, like you said, there hasn't been enough coverage about, you know, 
what's looking like the next humanitarian crisis. Um, and it, it's at least good that they're talking about it. And I think there's, there's lots of work to do uh, to make sure that we come out with, with policies that are going to really help Puerto Rico. Charles Kahn, Ed Morales, thank you so much, both thank of you, you, for coming in. Thanks for having us. You can find more information at our website. The Summer Leadership Institute was created out of a need to learn. It was originally meant as a way to get uh, urban bushwomen to have stronger professional development. And then I thought, well, why, why should it just be urban bushwomen? Why shouldn't we open it out and, and learn by having a lot of people in the room and not just ourselves? Blackbird, Blackbird, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Blackbird, Blackbird, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? That diversity was a key part of our learning. Not to have the room look like, oh, we're a rainbow tribe, but because it was through these diverse perspectives that we could, in fact, we would grow. The asset mapping that we do allows people to bring into the room all of the amazing strengths that they have, and that is restabilizing. That does help them come back to their core. Urban Bushwomen is about being whole. Urban Bushwomen work is deliberate about addressing wholeness. Our culminating performance is a culminating and integration of our learning. It's a way for us to come back together as a community through performance, but it's also a way for us to integrate this knowledge into our bodies, into our hearts, into our minds, into our guts. And, and it's, a, it's a restorative practice. So in the ways that we yoga has restorative practices. The culminating performance is a restorative practice of the Summer Leadership Institute. It brings us back together to be whole. If you set up the process in a way that is open, inviting, and has structure, but, but that structure can be fluid when it needs to be, the genius of the group will always emerge. I trust that.
law, contemporary blowback, a chase the rich approach to development. It's not just Puerto Rico that is mired in debt and sparing the rich at the expense of the poor. It's also New Haven. That Connecticut city is in a long drawn out fight with its very own colonial power, Yale. At issue is an 1834 state law that granted the university a special tax exemption. Because they serve the public good, private colleges, don't forget, are exempt from federal and state taxes, most of them, at the city level under that 1834 law, ostensibly because Yale trained priests for the local community was exempt from paying tax on some commercial properties. Now New Haven is dominated by Yale, a university, as well as a medical complex. Just like in Baltimore, it was Johns Hopkins. What these cities have in common is that manufacturing's declined and universities have expanded, while local officials encourage them because so-called eds and meds, colleges and hospitals, promise growth and jobs while doing good. They bring in federal and state dollars and they get tax breaks. But their success doesn't automatically translate into economic or social success for surrounding communities. Yale's budget is already bigger than many countries. Its endowment tops 23 billion. The college and its research complex are now New Haven's largest employer, but they're surrounded by poor and working class neighborhoods where unemployment is rife. Rates are, for African Americans and Latinos stand at between 18 and 20% just about double the rate of the city's white population. Hospital workers mostly earn low part-time wages. They're not members of unions. So what to do? Since taxing real estate and other property is the only form of municipal taxation allowed by state law in Connecticut, New Haven Mayor Tony Harp says that the city really does need to reconsider that 1834 exemption. She's up against the Ivy League and local businesses who've threatened that any change would be a disaster, leading to a loss in jobs, an end to research, and the eviction of the local symphony. Still, Harp and her colleagues are not backing down, and that is in part because they have the support of a community-led coalition of clergy, labor, progressive, and community groups. The economy's changed over 182 years, they say. The law needs to likewise. Watch this space for an anti-colonial movement against colonial corporations in our cities. What do you think?